Hello everyone, today we talk about Philip the Ford's policies and their legacy uh, in the following uh, generations, in the mostly fact from the Capetians to the Valois, the latter being still Capetians, never mind, uh, talking a bit about, in fact, this early 14th century France that deserves um, a lot of consideration, considering both, in fact, the previous and the following times, because as you know, this was fundamentally the peak, not just of medieval France, but in many ways of medieval Europe, and it's fair to say that French power as a whole at this point was essentially the largest that um, had ever existed in Europe after the um, medieval Europe, after the Carolingian one. And uh, that underwent, as you know, in the mid 14th century, a crisis, an important cr crisis that, in this fact, kind of elephantiac background that, that the French state, as such, starts, um, in fact, assuming, was much more, in fact, creaky, in, especially the outskirts, but eventually winning the, the Hundred Years' War, still as a, essentially as a political formula. And that fundamentally is the base of the Ancien Regime as we know it. France had expanded dramatically, to say the least, in the 13th century. And uh, the state building that had occurred at the time was still mostly feudal in nature. We will see it later. The greatest example was Philip IV's grandfather, Louis IX, that was just as a saint, was the most powerful ruler in Europe at the time, which was affirmed by his aura of sainthood um, itself, um, and that shown in a kind of a Polonian sense, though, because um, France had not been touched yet by the, uh, the, the crisis, the stagnation, and eventually the decline that encompasses, again, all of Eurasia fundamentally and beyond, but that in the case of such um, very quickly grow, uh, expanded um, realm had its most uh, visible and kind of absolute effects in the reign of Philip IV that was still considered, you know, essentially the, the actually having increased, as we will see now, monarchic power in the same France. In many ways, um, the sense that the authoritarian power of the same realm, but that had to cope with enormous challenges that today we will not see because um, we shall make a video on, on, on that specifically. I mean, all the political, military, economical issues, right? And that um, somehow has been interpreted, at least in a bit kind of a negativistic way as... Uh, you know, uh, not necessarily a failing ruler, but definitely someone who wanted to achieve some standards that were, however, beyond, uh, at this point, out of the reach of the same monarchy, was in, in a realm that was instead actually contracting, right? And so it's obvious that the same Apollonian symbolism um, falls when, you know, you, you outstretch kind of power in a way and this doesn't mean that, however, the struggle that happens internally and the measures that are required to maintain control are, in that sense, not um, kind of more justified than the ones uh, that were just taking place in, 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 if you want, even in a more autonomous, in a more in tandem cooperation between the monarchy and the country, just like it had happened in the 13th century. There is a lot of legacy from, in fact, the previous time that uh, is reflected in Philip IV's policy, but there is also a lot of new stuff that today we will look at, and that um, also help us understanding, really, for the first time historically, how the inner mechanisms of, of the monarchy and the representative bodies really function, because historically there is a point, it is the first one, like in also in many other areas of Europe, there is a, a more advanced historiography, there is just a more subtle um, apparatus that allows, right, properly 
just to, to read its do to, that that preserves its documents that are thus um, surviving in greater numbers. Um, and this is all a consequence, of course, already of, of the crisis, already of a system that must regulate heavily after a very fast and sometimes even uncontrolled expansion. And in many ways, it, it's a relatable time because we are in a very close phase. On Schwerpunkt, I talk about Philip the Fault, um, mostly just for the struggle with the papacy that um, was actually allied with with France, with the Angevins, um, etc., as this um, macroscopic wealth axis. Um, and that, however, as strong as actually this connection could be, um, still entailed um, an important struggle for defining the internal prerogatives, a, a little bit just like it had happened during the investiture controversy that in many ways is resumed by France uh, at the same uh, at the same time. At this point, the, the empire has fundamentally disgregated uh, as a unitary monarchy. It's just something very different. France has taken on the role of the empire in Europe. So such problems would remain, except naturally France had had historically since ever right a um, a much um, you know more first of all friendly, but also very peculiar relation with with the papacy um, for many reasons that we can't digress on. So the thing was say less escalatory than of course the investor struggles in many ways was a much more violent military matter, right? Uh, the French and the Ghibellines, and this alliance is quite fascinating in, 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 the, in, in the region around Rome that sees the, the papal treasury slap Boniface VIII that dies after a while. You know, it's, it's a famous slap, in, metaphorically or not, uh, that sh exemplifies brilliantly the, these mechanisms that are much more complicated than the dichotomy Guelphism and Ghibellinism in fact be about um, that we have somehow you know uh, hypothesized. I made a video about Guelphs and Ghibellines in that kind of mostly political and social intertwinement but in that sense it was mostly like uh, an Italian communal phenomenon that was connected with this um super authorities that very often however had to rely just on these blocks alone to work and the I made a video I think last autumn about the, the, the imperial nature of the French monarchy so a bit of scissor papistic insight in the tradition that since that video straddles um, the entire Middle Ages, right? You know, from the, from the Merovingians to the Capetians, um, and uh, and beyond. Even if again, you know, the Capetians were from there on the only dynasty, truly, aside from the various vassal kind of branches of the same family. Um, that I think are uh, is is an interesting video uh, in on its own because we have. Uh, rarely, like the impression that, at least as far as I see around in pop culture, the idea that France was the actual empire in Europe uh, at this point, and especially in, probably in the peak of medieval civilization, and this um, this definitely triggered a lot of of, of mechanisms. And there is um, something I made about the medieval, the French, uh, yeah, the medieval French nobility, about also the the French armies of this times. They're all intertwined topics that um, also, for example, the one about uh, the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, we have seen actually gives us back an idea of a stronger France, right? Even in time of crisis and of fragility than the one is usually painted, right? It doesn't. It, this is the proof on the long run that the system withstood uh, constant blows and managed to stand on its feet. Well, great part of the success is, of course, to be to be explained by investigating what France had already been established like, um, and how it kept operating, mostly on the base of such um, an enormous ruler like Philip. Again, 
France would, wouldn't have for generations, many generations, the same power, especially the monarchy per se, that Philip IV had. Um, and also this happened in very different circumstances where uh, you can't argue that France was, it was the most powerful country in Europe, but also at that point by a lesser degree compared to other, to the, to the bulk of, of the other countries in Europe. Um, then as it, different in fact from, from Philip IV's time, and France does have these ups and downs, but also it's not always in fact in the same measure compared to the rest, right? made videos about, uh, I don't know, the, the French armies of the Italian wars, also the, the, war, the, the French army of Louis XIV and beyond. So we'll keep talking about that at some point. In any case, if you look at this period be between, say, the early um, uh, and uh, the second half of the 14th century, you can start grasping those political mechanisms, how properly policy was formulated, right, how mm, the, the royal everyday conduct of business practically functioned, um, at least it can be followed in some detail, right, we don't have everything, but we do get down to some very interesting aspects that reveal us how essentially the relation between the royal household, the council, the chancery, the treasury, and the parliament of Paris um, the departments uh, of state and other institutions formed that regime that we can't properly start assessing at this point is you know, basically the same one that would last until 1789 1792 uh, so you understand it's, it's of a, a incredible importance just per se it's, it's, we're still in a formative stage. We don't see, of course, the, the thing already delivered by this point. It was built over time, um, notoriously, right? But the mentality, uh, the political practice, the even the cynical, kind of almost pre-modern, in fact, view, right, of government that is affirmed at this point, I think is, is quite thought-provoking, because as I tended to show in my videos, um, I do believe that there is an incredible advantage in an equilibrated society, right, that should be maintained uh, at, at great cost, right, but there is a point in which things start shrinking beyond the capacity of rulers to keep the entire system going, and so there must be essentially a nationing of politics, or at least you know, becoming harsher from what politics fundamentally or always is by a degree or another. I mean, the, the deeply, um, you know, it is true that politics is about power and conflict. Um, and it is about uh, dominance. It's, it's about hierarchy, right? How do we balance it to make it, uh, to make the entire system stand? Now, that's quite a, a question. And not one that applies just to, you know, different categories of government. This is something that is uh, this is a problem for the liberal democratic regimes as much as for the totalitarian and socialistic ones. And there is um, a measure that you can identify, naturally in a time in history in which the, 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 the state didn't have any of the comparably the scale of power that it has today. So when things were made even more difficult and a, a risk to um, of of the whole thing collapsing was pretty much a lie, and so that in in the accomplishment of civilizations here uh, should be much more appreciated when it fundamentally succeeded, especially in such a strained uh, context. We can start studying from this time onwards, the programs pursued by the various governments, literally the, the, the many kings that, as you know, also followed one another after Philip, uh, also with the dynastic change of the Valois, um, but even you know within the same dynasty. They were, again, the same family, but brothers, 
fathers and sons could have uh, very different views, right? And uh, changing kind of entourage at every generation in a in bloody political feuds, by the way. Still having, however, the, the monarchy going on functionally. And so a state going on functionally. And so also these strains were to be calibrated adequately. Um, so we can also start seeing how the, the royal council is composed for, right, politically, right, both in the branches and in the, literally, in demanding, we can study the patronage, the clientage networks. Um, so the essence of politics that will remain also similarly um, as, a, as a trajectory of this development in, in the following centuries. Particularly important was the relation between the crown and its servants. Also, the ideas that circulate on how to rule the Kingdom of France, right? We have already observed the, the quite composite nature of what, in fact, seemed more like an empire than, than a kingdom. There were some neighboring uh, countries that uh, juridically fell in, into the, the, the kingdom as far as at least the, the older administrative repartition of uh, late Carolingian times was concerned. Uh, we made a video about uh, Flanders recently, around the same period. We made a video about medieval Brittany that would be incorporated de facto in, in the kingdom of France only in, in, in the modern age. Burgundy, that also, as you know, was essentially a, a parallel state, albeit essentially a copy of the same French thing, and also because the Valois Burgundy were Capetians themselves. Gascony, that remained essentially like an enclave of at least of English dominated um, uh, reality, somehow more distant from the Parisian government. Then you have properly the bulk of the, um, the royal appanages, that is to say, lands that were ruled normally by the Capetian dynasty and its branches. So those who, in fact, would also become kings at some point. In fact, we have the Anjou, but the Valois, um, the Poitou, the Evreux, le, La Marche, le Bourbon, the latter, by the end of the, the Middle Ages, had become fundamentally a state within the state as well. As you know, during the Italian wars, they allied themselves with the Germans and the Spanish. Um, then you had uh, some smaller districts that, however, still were significantly powerful, such as Alençon, Blois, Forêt, and also some, still some turbulence in the south that, as you know, had been properly uh, conquered and dominated by the French now, as historically was um, another country, per se, of a, in Occitania, that, however, that in this times of, of crisis, of course, was still more difficult to reach from the north, doesn't matter how powerful the monarchy was, and so so a lot of local lords doing shady stuff, we're talking about the, um, the rulers of Foix, of Armagnac, of Albre, the Comminges, and so on. Then there is also this point, uh, as we have observed on our uh, so in recent videos about the the, the 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 European communes mm -hmm. and urban development, and political autonomy of these centers, and so on, and significance in the institutional hierarchy, the so-called bonne ville de France, right? These were um, essentially the uh, the provincial capitals emerging in in, in many ways. Some um, actually around Paris, it would be a gradual flattening, right? But especially as far uh, as the in fact this periphery was concerned these this cities were quite important because in a sense they uh, checked a bit the nobility expansion they could be ruled in a kind of more mediated fashion by royal representatives and they would uh, 
um, it would be as important centers that would still strengthen in spite of um, say in relative terms in the in, in the country politically institutionally in spite of the of the crisis of course with the black death and, and also war just per se down with truth economic contraction traffics that fundamentally move away, away from France during the the toughest phases of the Hundred Years War, the the, the chevauchée and so on, that however are ever more connected with royal policy and ever more directly and fundamentally secure an administrative role in um, essentially in provincial government. And all consider this mosaic um, being ruled by a single dynasty that now is, is gradually centering for good in Paris with its own, you know, proper uh, offices and so on, but very gradually still in a sort of, again, imperial feudal mindset that still sees, by the way, and this is typically French since Merovingian times, the, the kingdom has essentially, uh, let's say, the, the ruling dynasty not just sacred, but fundamentally owning privately the entire realm as a personal possession, right? So uh, that's something you have, if that if you affirm as an authority, uh, you also have to be able to maintain as such. And the French will actually develop differently from, from the English and what had occurred naturally, especially after 1215, a um, kind of liking of, because they realized that uh, such um, uh, incredibly populated and um, productive country, especially from an agricultural point of view, so immense masses of people and resources could not be controlled uh, if not through this kind of even iron fist fundamentally and through a quite heavy kind of um, establishment in terms of prerogatives we've seen also how the nobility had began to, to, to lock itself by far right now um, and trigger some mechanisms that would bring essentially a high nobility to ever be ever more in charge of all these various branch, which is in a very stratified uh, situation. And consider all these communities that were listed having, as it was typical in, in medieval Europe, all their own administrations, customs, privileges, um, and answering relation, say, different relationships with the crown, different privileges, different histories, right, um, and more. And the, the huge effort is trying to, to unify this further, to homogenize this further in the midst of a crisis as well. This is very relatable in many ways. Um, there was also not really um, a, a true national identity uh, the, in, in France, right? Or at least if, if it, it did exist in some form, it was embryonic, to say the least. Because essentially up to the century before, um, the the country had not even started having a, 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 so, a, a, a true sovereign, right? At least de facto in, in many areas that had remained autonomous for, for centuries, right? Where the Capetians had basically never ventured and that spoke different languages that uh, had other customs. As we've seen here, there are the Celts of, of, of Brittany, there are the Occitanians, in, in basically uh, a huge part of, of, of the South. There are some, you know, countries with essentially diff that are centrifugally developing, you know, it's kind of autonomous identities such as Flanders and other areas. Um, there is an expansion in, as we've seen, especially for the Dauphiné uh, videos we made, uh, an expansion in Burgundy, an acquisition literally of lands that had not historically and kind of formally or juridically belonged to the Kingdom of France. Even important cities like Lyon that will simply devote itself to, to, to the Capetians and would pass to France and it's still today basically the largest, the second largest city after Paris. So, in, in France, so important histories that we will have also to follow territorially step by step in, in dedicated videos. Uh, the only and true unifying factor, of course, was the mystique of the Capetian monarchy, uh, the sacredness of, of royal blood, 
that it was truly saint, also in fully Christian terms, uh, but had always had its um, incredible hematophiliac power that, that we all know, probably an imperial uh, mentality, a rigid, stern one that the court had been cultivating for, for centuries, premises that were in fact of u universal in scale, such as the crusading one, as it had been mostly essentially um, headed at least by, by the French historically, um, there was in fact, um, you know, Angevins sitting on the throne gradually of, of Naples, of, of Hungary, of Poland even, right, so a huge system that stretched from the Channel to the Aegean, right, and uh, that only at this point was beginning to, to contract and thus basing itself mostly on a, on a more local, national kind of uh, scaled uh, dimension. Under Philip IV, um, this contraction had already been evident. There were lots of financial issues uh, that also trigger, as we'll see, the, you know, the confiscations of all the Templars, the Jewish and the, the Lombard uh, resources. This was typical, right? Also, Henry VIII would do the, essentially the, the, the same with the monasteries for, under the, the, the formality of, of, the, of the Reformation. But um, it, this, this was a problem for a world in which the state as such didn't quite exist in more articulate f founded forms. And the reason was just communities being much more autonomous and in this sense also rowing often backwards, right? Having the, always kind of this centrifugal push that instead of saying, okay, we want to be strong in a, in a unitary sense so that if we all agree, we want to... Um, you know, to, we, we can maintain our autonomy by simply, however, giving, you know, uh, our supporting uh, the, the monarchy for a common end that we can benefit all from. In this moment of contraction, of course, communities become ever more short-sighted. The people properly don't, don't care anymore, right? This is just what we're seeing today. There's a dramatic collapse of any moral, um, civic, and um, educational standard everywhere. Like the masses are simply sinking back um, where they came from, and this is largely their fault, of course. So the, the monarchy at this point has problems that must also solve in increasingly uh, brutal terms. Because otherwise, the system, if it depended just on what the same monarchy had been relying on before, would collapse. And this naturally would trigger some reaction, some opposition, and so on. In Philip IV's time, still, the system was salvaged because the 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 full brunt of the crisis had not really, you know, been uh, received now. Um, and essentially authoritarian government had made up for the fissures in, in the, in the poli politic. Right. Things became more complicated in the following centuries, especially uh, in the following decades, excuse me, especially the 20s of the 14th century. Um, that are a bit um, a, a fastly contracting time in Europe, probably un underestimated. I specialize exactly in this, right? I mean, uh, not just the 20s, but the early, early 14th century, but I spotted in the 20s, 25, 28, that it's those years, exactly, in fact, the ones, the latter end of the change from the Capetians to the Valois. And uh, some years later, the beginning of the same Hundred Years' War, which, uh, in a sense, was triggered, as we've seen also in the video about Flanders, by the the tensions that existed in that case between the, the monarchy and the, the peripheral subjects. There is no doubt that the reign of Philip the Fair, Philip IV, marks the culmination of the medieval French monarchy. It was an unprecedented power of, of an incredible uh, scale that the same members of the of, of the Capetian dynasty recognized and with, with fear. Even you know, if you were the king's brother or something, they they realized that in spite of all these authoritarian means, were the consequence of the uh, extraordinary success of of the system. 
in the previous generation. So it's something that they felt entitled to maintain in many ways, as they had resources to spend in that direction. However, in the following generations, uh, as you know, the monarchy would start losing control pretty critically. Right? We will see this in another video, especially during, you know, after the the, the terrifying blows of, of the Hundred Years' War uh, that opened dramatic crisis as, as, as it had never been seen before. If, uh, there were mistakes that the French monarchy made, uh, perhaps, right? Um, historiography is always sometimes categorical. Um, I have the impression all the time that I study something from, especially from the past, that it's not much that we don't know sometimes whether a political choice was positive or negative, but uh, I think we we can't properly we can't properly assess on the base of, of the data that we have at least that if it was a gamble, it was still something understandable in that situation. But it was hardly like uh, it, we seem to make much more inconsiderate choices today than at the time, right? Everything was relatively simpler than today. It was just harder, which is another thing, right? Um, we're spoiled in other ways. So we have to think that people in the past were spoiled as, as n not quite, right? For example, the, uh, the resources needed for the Flemish War... Um, uh, have been uh, cl uh, uh, were, were, have been claimed to, to have been misjudged by the French monarch. This is somehow debatable, right? I made a video about the Battle of Courtrai, and we saw there that you know even if contemporary historiography st still keeps saying that this was you know just a turning point, a major thing. It, it did have a, a great moral effect, but you know itself, if you look at what the French did on the field, they they were actually very competent, and they fought dramatically well, and they managed to break through the, the Flemish phalanx. Um, so, in other words, they, they were competent enough, in spite of the debate in the, the command and whatever. So, surely mistakes were done at different times, as, as always, but you can't necessarily say that if just that for tiny thing, things had gone otherwise, today we would be having the same opinion. Right? Uh... The autocratic turn, especially of Philip's later years, um, contributed to the crisis of the leagues in 1314-15 that we will see uh, when essentially royal authority was challenged and was, uh, uh, f say, uh, obliged or at least you know decided to to formally concede many charters to several. Um, territories that would increase their own autonomy. Right. In Philip IV's time, the regime was perceived as austere, uh, enigmatic, awesomely powerful. Philip was an incredibly uh, erratic uh, figure. He is said not to have ever changed expression in the public um, occasions, he, he wanted literally to embody that kind of universal, the, the divine, um, that's perfect and unchangeable and modifiable power that the French monarchy was embodying sacredly as well. He was kind of very much into trying to, to, to follow the, the footsteps of, of, his, of his grandfather. And this appearance, of course, was functional to, to, to the ideology of um, continuity, right, of um, undefeatable, kind of um, uh, unmistakable um, royal power. And it, it succeeded to a large degree in, in those circumstances. I mean, people were really scared by this story. We don't know, maybe he was pretty easygoing you know, privately. Right, one always wonders this kind of thing. But of course, um, there is no doubt that these sovereigns felt the necessity of acting in incredibly ferocious ways as well, just to maintain control of a system that otherwise would have 
collapsed. And two consequences that were much better felt at the time, because the, the powers had always been somehow a step away from from collapse, even the, the, the strongest ones. Like, lots of things could go wrong easily at the same time for everything to be screwed up, right? Um, there were some Aragonese ambassadors, or envoys, to say better at this point, in 1305, um, who commented on Philip, whatever he wants, he will do, right? Which is a hell of a, of a statement, also considering that France and Aragon weren't really in good terms. Philip had bailed out of Catalonia, of, of his father's Catalonian camp, and, you know, Philip III had died um, as a result of, of a battle against uh, against the Spaniards, and he had redirected uh, the Fran- French expansionism towards the, the directly opposite axis, geographically in the northeast against Flanders, in fact. Uh, but the Aragonese were always careful right, not to trigger too much. You know, The Kingdom of France was an incredibly uh, complicated policy ongoing there with the Papacy, with, um, with Sicily, this is well after, as you know, the, the Vespers and uh, the Aragonese were fully involved essentially in a Ghibelline policy worldwide. But sometimes the papacy, especially during the strains with, with France, would somehow wink at different players also because uh, the same crime of Aragon, as you know, was fragmented in different chunks that operated as fundamentally different, uh, as, as it was technically different kingdoms. The same um, king's favored brother... Charles of, of Valois, who would become king himself, uh, said, He is our lord, and we cannot force him or his council. This is remarkable, because it it's literally means that, as, as the king's brother, you, you don't have even much of a... you know, And as the possible n- new ruler. Um, by the way, very active political fi- and military figures, as we will see, these were still men who went out there fighting. It was still a very knightly, um, chivalry and and bloody um, reality where you had to firm yourself in arms. Couldn't do anything about um, uh, against, practically, even mildly, the king and his council. Right, So a council that was starting to, to assume an, an unprecedented power embodying this kind of concentrating uh, effort. Um, we all know what happened to, to the Templars under Philip's reign. We know of the expropriations um, at the uh, detriment of, of the Jews and the Lombards. There were coming backs at different times because, say, the Italian bankers financed actually most of Philip's enterprises. They, they subcontracted mercenaries to, to rush against the, the, the Flemish after the disaster of the um, of Courtrai, of the Golden Spores. Um, so it was an incredibly ruthless, cold, and um, probably well calculated policy that uh, just said, we need money. If we don't have this money, the system will collapse. How do we get it fast? Right? You don't have the time to develop a complicated, kind of bureaucratic, administrative system that takes a lot of time, a lot of political negotiations. If you have resources at hand, seize them, right? We can't think that Philip was pretty well aware of, of, of the, the gravity of these actions, as much as, however, what, what had prompted them, right? So th- there is uh, a heavy ideologism, we will see in another video, the, the degree of propaganda that was incredibly efficient and capable and successful, right? You know, you can't say propaganda and fully no one, right? To hate today, we have very well exa- uh, very good examples of that. But say propaganda was a formidable mean of the time. Very often we read. I mean, at least the gullible people today, after an ocean of ink written and research about this thing, right? They believe things like I don't know, um, Boniface VIII was a pedophile because just you know you're a paranoid, post kind of modern anti-clerical, um, not that you know, uh, but that doesn't even know where does those voices come from. If you have never studied the colonies propaganda, you, you cannot even understand anything about Boniface VIII's 
uh, Rain historical figure. I mean, it's it's just as important as Boniface's propaganda or Philip's, uh, Philip's propaganda at this point. Um, so th there was a lot of um, state building too, uh, as far as it was possible, of course, for the means at the time, politically, governmentally. Um, if you want to research, as I was saying at the beginning, the origins of the modern French state, well, you have to look at this, right? You, you know, you properly have the, the affirmation of a, of an authority that can rule over a given territory, its resources, goods, people, and that fundamentally is just in charge, in control of the whole thing, right? Socially, economically, culturally, politically, it all depends on the market. It, it, this is the moment where it really start this thing really starts in France right before it was just kind of a feudal control that was gradually extending through the system of clientele at this point France starts developing also its um, strong juridical um, you know culture the, the, the monarchy takes on a monopoly of justice uh, the power to wage war making peace uh, imposing taxes controlling coinage this all is, is standardized, is, is concentrated, is consolidated to withstand the storm, right? Definitely, um, the, there was some previous work, again, that started mostly from, from the 12th century, that direction. Um, but this is the moment of full institutionalization, of ideological affirmation, and of monarchic... Um, uh, control, right? Fully, um, the, the acquisition of full monarchic control on these uh, uh, systems. Um, this, the thing would keep growing. Philip IV uh, stands out as a dramatic um, accelerator. This phenomenon, the, the, the one that shifted uh, the uh, the mechanism towards the the full autonomy. It was a kind of self-perpetuating system under, at least the, of course, still the, the royal action that worked a lot to, to make it going on still, but that was now fully um, entitled to do so. Um, basically, every domestic and international policy at this point starts uh, proving this and enhancing it and reaffirming it. Mm -hmm. All this went in parallel with a with a different mindset uh, from from the crown to, to the subjects, right? Um, and there is an incredible degree of repression as well, of um, especially some of the elements that had traditionally supported the monarch. In fact, noblemen, barons, provincial princes, and the same church, as the struggle with Boniface VIII will proves, um, are fundamentally uh, undermined to the advantage of the king. This again is because the the uh, the monarchy had gained an, an enormous. Um, power reserve, right? And now, when things were getting more turbulent, could spend it to quell all the, the major issues. Um, what is meaningful in this regard is that when, for example, the... Um, uh, the the thirteen fourteen thirteen fifteen uh, opposition rose. The reform program and also the ones that were kind of uh, issued uh, up until the sixties of the fourteenth century were based on that same uh, concept of. Um, uh, money, low taxes, equitable justice and the protection of the church that had characterized 
Louis the Ninth. Great. So in other words, that same model of Christian kingship that the Saint Philip was um, had had collected and was still using, and that uh, was uh, by this point used, in fact, by these the the subjects to remind the crowd that they had been habituated to be treated in a specific way, and that now the more authoritarian regime was uh, coming to to threaten right or and or at least to to limit to kind of to to oppose when of course this was also instrumentalized to some kind of uh, uh, autonomistic direction so a weakening of the monarchy as well so it was definitely a struggle between two forces as a response to this uh, resuming of Saint Louis' uh, model, the same monarchic um, jurists created uh, some works right, prescribing the, the, the rights of the crown in an emphatic way. One is the Questio in Utranque Partem in 1303, and John of Paris's De, po- uh, De Potestate Regia et Papali. Um, this naturally were to be read also in a broader international context, in the struggle against Boniface VIII. It's, all a, it's not just an internal thing. I mean, it, it always had a reflection on that too, but there is here a, a bigger picture that we're not analyzing, just looking at French institutions per se. Um, so you understand it, it's funny in a way because it's as if Philip IV there was countering the same model that he had been collected but it was being also used by by other by, by his subjects to, to claim look but your grandfather did it in a different way. In parallel to this there was an important um, juridical development in France. He made a video about this regarding the um, uh, the, the, the study of a Roman law that at this point had been deeply ingrained probably in the juristic um, kind of culture of Europe and especially these greater powers needed because Roman law as you know was um, essentially the Theodosian Code um, reworked by Justinian in which the fundamental Caesar propistic prerogative of the Byzantine emperors as also leaders say, over the church, um, essentially conferred the, the, would have conferred the papacy in the West, no temporal power. It's, it's in a way, as we've seen just the other day, that the same reason why Frederick Barbarossa uh, funded the, the Bolognese studium during his campaigns in Italy against the Lombardy uh, League, support, supported by the papacy, and so on. So, uh, in the struggle against Boniface VIII, it's not surprising that the same imperial mindset is being used by the king of France, right? Um, the last Capetians were hesitant, telling the truth, to prosecute treason and rebellion as severely as a Roman uh, so civil w- uh, law allowed, right? However, there are some instances in which uh, the French monarchy really acted heavily, and in line actually with some political situations that somehow motivated them. For example, Charles IV's um, persecution of the Gascon troublemaker Jourdain de Lille Jourdain um, ended up with the exemplary execution of the same in 1323. So, you're taken out. Um, On that occasion, there was... um, uh, the the continuator of uh, Guillaume de Nangis' uh, chronicle, who wrote, never since the days of Ganelon, there would be Gan of Mines, right from the Carolingian epos, the, the, the traitor par excellence, had such a very great and gentle man died in such a fashion. Naturally, here, great and gentle stands for, for you know, the, the status of the man, right? So the idea is that, of course, yes, the, the king was not just chasing common criminals personally. He was 
targeting political opponents of some relevance, right? So essentially, the, the, the royals already um, had skipped kind of the, the, the nobility of, of the man and, and had murdered this official cynically and exploiting um, also the delays of the same law, because this is interesting, right? That Again, there are different courts everywhere in the, in the country the, or the different communities and so on. So, of course, the king has the supreme uh, saying here um, as far as, um, you know, at least in, in relative terms uh, regarding kind of the, the, the possibility of uh, legislating on the base of the interpretation, as we've seen, of civil law or other customs. But there is also a law that also pursues depending on the political interest, right? And so here we're looking mostly at a royal private feud that um, ended up with the thing accomplished in, in spite of any other kind of complicated juridical issue. I'm not digressing now on the legal circumstances because they are really complicated, but you understand the point. I mean, the, also in, in, at the end of the Middle Ages, again, differently from England, you have essentially a, a French juridical culture that is the same, the traditional one, right? The, there is a sort of pre-existing natural right of the communities that is to be respected by the king in order for him to be king in the first place. But if there is something to add, like a gap, a lacuna in the juridical science or whatever, or simply the king wants to issue new laws, there is a tendency in France essentially to support the king's doing uh, because of the aforementioned reasons of how do we keep together the whole thing in, in the first place, and also a much more hierarchical society there that could, of course, see from, from the above how and why this these actions, unless they weren't targeting that person, were somehow un understandable. And in fact, if you look at the early Valois kings, you, you see that they were already habituated to, to act in similar ways. For example, Philip VI, that ruled between 1328 and 50, used increasingly such arbitrary procedures, even against very powerful people, right? And th this wasn't even just always a success, right? Actually, um, even political damage uh, followed uh, in unexpected ways. By the way, because that may always be the thing. Like, the idea is that if you start with this stuff, you, you set up a precedent that can be used in different ways politically. Um, there is probably a juridical concept named cas royaux uh, that means royal case, right? That refer to particularly serious crimes that were at that point deemed justiciable only by the king's court and that in this regard could be fundamentally defined as such only by the king right so it was a way of saying who does decide that somebody can step above the law well the king does right and it's in his case right because only the, the king was self allowing this right to himself but not to other authorities and to other courts uh, of course, and uh, you understand the, the aforementioned quote by uh, Charles of, of Valois regarding his brother saying the council had acquired such a huge power as a consequence. Uh, and the lawyers operating for the king here were really the key guys, right? The, um, the, 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 I mean, the lawyers of, of Philip IV are some of the, the most uh, important figures there, but also the following one, like think about Philip uh, de, de Nogaret, that there are lots of, of famous names, but also the ones that started operating in later kings, even just for a short amount of time, were, were impressive. They were, were very powerful people on their own, sometimes even shrewdly pursuing their own private interest, even not necessarily in line with the king as a consequence, because that's also what you create. It's an extreme measure that, however, erodes the same kind of by the book um, fair play that had been established between the king and the subjects in both directions, right? Uh, naturally, the French kings were also insanely powerful on their own, privately speaking. 
right? So they had the best uh, lawyers, they educated them, they, they nurtured them uh, in, in, many, in many ways. And this is what essentially makes the Parisian parliament growing, be becoming essentially the, the major feature um, of this period, if you want, in, in French, uh, in, in, in the history of French institutions. And that dealt not only, as we were saying, with domestic issues, but also international ones. Because at the end of the day, this is still a feudal system, and lots of things going on with succession of very large, powerful state like I don't know Burgundy, Navarre. Uh, in that case, even in fact outside the Kingdom of France, but is to be uh, litigated. We we talked about this, especially in the video about medieval, the, properly the history of the Duchy of Burgundy and all the succession issues. Um, which line to follow, on which basis, and with which circumstances, you do need lawyers that also start digging kind of very old source material that could support ideologically uh, uh, the king to a, a doctrinal body of some sort that eventually would become law, in fact, um, juridical science. Right. Um, with the Hundred Years' War, there are also martial considerations, because after um, Edward III invaded France in 1337, Philip VI and John II had to deal with those towns and castles that had basically um, been in kind of treasonable communication with, with the enemy, right? Of course, they this, this centers would negotiate with, say, the, the English army was arriving, they were on the way, that even if they would have preferred not to, to, to be, uh, maybe to, to lean in favor of the invaders or, 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 or anything, this could provide the French monarch with a, with a very interesting opportunity for punishing and, uh, the, them, and and essentially seizing great part of their power, right? So obviously this could not be done in a normal situation, nor even in an extraordinary one, but given that uh, the war fit the latter and lots of things happen uh, practically, aside from the, you know, political, juridical theory, uh, the, the French kings would carry out exemplary punishment and... Uh, say, of course, in a pretty dire uh, situation, still managing to acquire sometimes a greater control in some frontier areas where they knew, in fact, the, the enemies would have kept operating and so that they needed control, so from a military point of view, directly. Um, naturally, war does uh, hinge France, in the case of this, especially greater chunks, as you know, with Burgundy, with Brittany, um, that played kind of a more shady way. But there were lots also of small communities that instead stuck to the king. And in fact, we observed this, um, it's much later, but in that video about Louis XI, um, who relied heavily, especially on cities. Right. In, also, in fact, in an anti-nobility sense, because the noblemen ran the country anyway. And so um, this is something that had saved the monarch even at the time of the Viking raids, which paradoxically um, many smaller vassals increased um, kind of royal power by recognizing it as a, as a legitimate institution in the face of nobility that was simply siding with the Vikings for their shady deals, and that were just to, to benefit on the longer run locally, because the Vikings more or less went away, um, except in the case of Normandy, um, but that, in fact, had gained, in fact, clamorous power that would take the Capetians centuries, as, in fact, just appeared after the one we, we discussed from, after Bouvine, um, that uh, that had been such an obstacle for the recompaction of French power. 
Um, there was also another praxis that was to essentially sentence some mm, fugitives in abs absentia so to formulate new mm, uh, new 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 juridical praxis and theory uh, and political trend as to say well you know, if you escaped from this place because you knew that the king would go after you, well, you don't even show up at, at a trial. Obviously, we can do more or less whatever you want to be, uh, we, we want of you. And uh, the the king was there to stay, right, in, in, as the the center of the system. Um, there was an important degree of cruelty and impulsiveness sometimes as well, right? There was properly a mentality. In, in, in France, but this was somehow typical of the entire feudal world that especially in this case there was a, probably a divine uh, rule of some sort that had been that it, it, as as long as it could rule with any mean, it was still God's will for them to do so so they had been habituated to this Incredible. I mean, th literally, these were the, the most powerful people in Europe, and so practically in the known world, because um, uh, the Europeans, at least the, the Pax Mongolica was over, and even uh, the contacts with China, of course, wouldn't still create so many com objective comparisons with which with whom was the, the most powerful ruler. So just think what it means to have being nurtured in that perspective, of being of royal blood, of being probably a nobleman, of, of seeing, like it was the case in France, mostly um, an immense amount of um, agricultural population just worked under other noblemen that fundamentally ruled the land. And so you were just above everyone in many ways. You had to respond directly to God, as the struggle with the papacy also practically symbolized because um, I would like to stress that the Saint Boniface VIII literally claimed to be Caesar, right? And the, the French kings were practically asserting the same, right? A, a, a total control, like an imperial one in fashion, at least over France, right? For which the, the papacy didn't have to interfere. This would uh, give rise to Gallicanism, to some autonomies that actually the French church had always had exactly because the papacy had supported the Capetians' rise and so on, but that now we're being developed further to say, okay, well, but, you know, it, um, we this is France, and as local kings, we control the church as we like, or at least we have to have some sort of control or over the, in fact, over the investitors. This is the same old problem of the of the bishops, uh, etc. Uh there is um, the, um, a harsh repression by the side of Philip VI of the Breton and Norman rebels in the years 1343 and 4. There is the judicial murder of Raoul de Brienne, there was the Count of Eu, in uh, 1350 by John II. Uh, also, his Caesar and execution of the defense supporters at Rouen in 1356. Which also triggered some savage revenge as well. It was the murder of the constable uh, Charles de la Cerda in 1354 by Charles II, King of Navarre. Um, and the, the guy was a, a leading French landholder and this prompted John II's reaction against uh, Navarre in 1356. Um, so it's a very international, as as you see, as well. So because these individuals have all interested pretty much uh, all around. Right, you can't see these policies again, not realizing what was happening abroad during the Hundred Years' War with the, the, the French neighbors and whatever. 
a further factor of stability was that, as you know, after Philip IV, mostly kings um, succeeded themselves for a while, but very rapidly. Right? There was a sort of um, curse uh, on the sovereigns. Um, and just brief reigns triggered um, quick changes, right? Opportunities to, to turn the tables, um, to target um, former opponents as uh, scapegoats just sometimes um, for, for example, carrying out unpopular policies uh, at, at similar things, sometimes just more personal issues and or, again, reasons of political balance. Um, we can see, for example, a striking succession of uh, executions um, of financial advisors. Right, some of the most important ones, for example, uh, that were all killed at the uh, next royal uh, succession. For example, Enguerrand de Marigny, that had been a fin leading financial advisor of Philip IV. Uh, Gérard uh, Guette, the one of Philip V. Pierre Remy, the one of Charles IV. Well, everyone who came later after these kings killed the guys, right? And you, you understand that given that these men were also expert in political, like in properly in administration, in government and so on, and they had been around for a while because they hadn't necessarily risen to the top, you know, just under the brief... Um, uh, the reign, right, in, in, in question, but they had all an experience. These were bureaucrats, skilled ones, during the 13th century, as you know, France had dramatically increased the power of also the, the bourgeoisie uh, and of this men of state, as opposed to vassals, right, you know, to, cent to concentrate power better. Well, you understand that you, you took out also very, very capable, powerful people who had somehow contributed to, to oil the machinery as well. Um, groups of councillors um, also alternated uh, in the same way. It was a struggle within themselves, right? The Chambre de Comte and the Parlement, for example, formed two distinct parties. The Chambre de Comte would deal with financial issues mostly, the, the Parliament too, but in kind of a more politically representative way. And so, in other words, they were respectively, you know, the, the Parlement would tell with which policy to pursue and the Chambre de Comte had to find the money, right? So they were closely intertwined and uh, the king supported one party or the other accordingly. Uh, for example, the mm, aggressive fiscal policies of Philip IV were um, aggressively... Uh, were aggressive enough, you know, in self, they were advocated strongly by figures like um, Henri de Sully, died in 1336, uh, Mille de Noyer, that was the bearer of the Oriflamme, by the way, in 1304, right? So, you know, the, the, the sacred royal banner of the, of the French monarchy, he, he would die in 1347. And um, this side that required, of course, increasing, uh, demanded for, for increasing taxation, and so for greater, you know, in fact, increase of the same royal power accordingly were mostly the, uh, the members of the Chambre de Comte, if not party, at least viewpoint, right, political tendency. Whereas other figures like uh, Etienne de Mornay, Councillor of Charles of Valois died in 1325. Uh, Chancellor of Toulouse uh, the, the Tent, ruling between 1314 and 16, and leading advisor of Charles IV, ruling between 1322 and 8, um, represented the Parlement side of, of the story. Uh, Guillaume de saint maur was Chancellor between 1330 1335 was quite useful um, for the for the King Philip VI, especially as he had risen to the throne. 
um, because um, through him the king could take out some mm, essentially people that had supported his succession and that now however had become too encumbered so um, Guillaume took on uh, the, the initiative and the responsibility to take them out of the way not by not damaging too much the the new king's um, position right after Guillaume's death however it's the aforementioned Mille de Noyer that takes on again the 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 lead um, as uh, between 1335-1346 as essentially the leading uh, figure of the Chambre de Comte Park uh, and uh, essentially getting also the king's favor accordingly. So it was kind of a sort of self-devouring monster as far as the um, this um, kind of I use this guy to to take out these guys and then I I take him out so to to to, to repress discontent as well. So you could take out lots of people. <laughs> Of the powerful people in, in the meanwhile, and strengthening the, the royal position by essentially exploiting this competition of the two parties to, to be in, in the king's favor. So, a, a ruthless but still somehow effective and um, and uh, successful policy, at least by a degree. Uh, there was naturally also a father son mm, conflictuality by a degree. Um, for example, um, uh, the policies pursued by Louis X and Charles IV can be seen uh, in this light, right? Uh, countering essentially what had been their fathers. Philip V and Philip VI um, instead reverted to personnel who had experience of government under Philip IV, right? So even coming back significantly um, and thus trusting elements that had been capable and that even if they had by that point fallen out of favor were still useful to be resumed in, in their in their government. Uh, when we look at Louis X uh, and especially all the charters that he issued right and and the sacrifice of Marigny in the process right that had supported instead a kind of a harder line against the, the autonomous communities we can see um, a political intelligence, right? This monarch is being considered as weak and ineffectual because he granted all these charters that were seen as a, a defeat of the monarch. Telling the truth, however, when uh, when he came to power, um, he had to manage a very difficult situation as a new king because his father had um, triggered a, a massive opposition and his uh, charter issue was actually a clever move to to quell the, uh, the the issue and to uh, stabilize significantly his own position as well, right? The sort of statementship uh, rather than than the weakness, just just per se, right? And we tend to to have that attitude, right? We don't realize again how difficult it was even for these kings to be in power and what it took just to stabilize the situation. Again, the system was creaking significantly. Consider these were the years of the Great Famine of 1315-1317. So, um, literally, um, the for, it, while it is true that, generally speaking, the crisis increased the degree of authoritarianism, by some degree also in France, uh, France was more targeted by by these kind of systemic factors, whether internal or external, and so even the various charters were issues uh, were issued at this point were um, somehow just the the natural consequence of that gradual shrinking of monarchic power that's still in 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 absolute. Um, I mean, in relative terms, was happening for such a large system, right? So the, what had happened in 1314-15 uh, is that there were these leagues of noblemen, clerics and townsmen that um, had uh, formed in many provinces, so highlighting the, the 
evident difficulties of the monarchy to, to keep control, at least with the current state of taxation, uh, this peripheral land. So that the year after he starts by granting the Charte au Normand, um, in fact on March the 19th, uh, we discussed this in the video about uh, the Duchy of Normandy. Um, then, consequently, uh, also other charters followed for the other provinces, for example for Languedoc uh, on April the 1st, um, and also another in, on January the th uh, uh, in January 1316. Uh, one for Burgundy in April and May the 17th, 1315. Uh, one for Artois. Uh, uh, one, uh, two for Champagne in May thir uh, 1315 and in March 1316, in Auvergne in September 1315, which was confirmed again nine years later, for Picardy, Poitou, Touraine, Anjou, Maine, Saintonge, the Angoumois in September 1315, for Berry in March 1316, Nevers in May 1316. Right, so a, a string of Charters that at that point was simply saying, okay, we heard you, we don't essentially have means to to oppose you, especially all at once, so we'll grant those charters that fundamentally will reduce the royal capacity to set, say, arbitrary um, taxation, at least by a degree that was considered uh, intolerable. And this would secure temporarily some some uh, some further autonomy. Again, in in perspective, uh, on the longer run, when you look at, for example, the Chateau de Normand, it's not that Normandy would actually acquire much uh, greater autonomy or power uh, on the longer run. Right? The, these were provinces practically at this point that were just trying to escape uh, direct control as far as they could. But eventually they would be retaken by the French monarchy and simply ruled without even much of a further kind of negotiational power um, on the long run. Because simply they had bailed out from the state. This is the interesting aspect of it. This is to say if, if these blocks had stuck together by conferring more power to, to France. But for example... Um, I don't know, maybe certain, uh, some of the, the most important battles of the Hundred Year War would have not been even fought or lost by France. And, and so history would have taken on a completely different course, because you know that even after the Treaty of Bretigny, there wasn't necessarily, uh, there, there were some things to settle, but even what happened in the kind of in the second, so-called second phase of, of the war, it would have not necessarily occurred. Uh, France would have not risked to be taken over, at least the, 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 the Valois monarchy to be knocked out, etc. Um, and there would have been, by the end of the war, better uh, preconditions to, to start augmenting French power as a wall that would have maybe indirectly favored through new conquest even those same provinces. So, of course, you cannot reason that teleologically because, in a moment of crisis, uh, the most frequent attitude is the one of freaking out. But it's actually a sign of a weakness, not of, like, accept that you're going to sink for a while, but then if you hold on for long enough, you can fundamentally make it. This is a huge, huge issue that should be understood today much better, right, in a way that in which we are dramatically softer, spoiled, rich, and whatever, and we complain just for so few, we start freaking out, saying it's all over, oh my god, gas prices, oil price, and nothing happens eventually, because of course, <laughs> it was not meant, of course, even to happen, and just reflect what it means, like, just living comparatively in 14th century France, and going through what actually happened there uh, where literally it's death uh, pretty commonly rich even for factors that are not necessarily political but just I don't know the plague right so just consider how soft spoiled whiny and kind of delusional we are in comparison uh, to, to this people uh, in, in many ways uh, 
in fact, what what you consider, and this is an interesting uh, d difference also with uh, with the baronial power acquired after the Magna Carta and the various constitutions were issued to reinforce it later. Now, these leagues um, we just um, named were were not trying to establish a lasting control over the monarch. Like the French didn't have that idea. They were just essentially complaining against the pressure that the monarchy had put on. And they were simply saying, "We, no more of this, please. But they didn't have, of course, any power uh, by that point to, to kind of actually say, oh, well, now we will fundamentally adjust you know, the, the, the monarchy at our will because we're coming now. Right? This was not England in 1215 after a massive defeat and a baronial takeover after years where fundamentally, if not uh, generations, which practically war had um, uh, afflicted the country you know, with rebellions and so on. This was a already a startled dimension warranted by the king that thus could be obstacle, um, but that was still to be, at this point, kind of unitarily in charge, in spite of the different relation that, as we've seen, he had with the, all the various communities. Right, and uh, these, um, like Louis the Tenth, uh, Chartres are um, actually very pr pragmatic of the monarchy to say, okay, let's not strain too much um, the rope because it, it, if it breaks, it breaks for everyone involved. Right, so the underlying all this relation, it's it's some kind of alliance still existing between the various chunks of the kingdoms that at the end of the day stopped even being fond of being just an autonomous peripheral province and began to understand that the advantages, the stability, etc. derived from from a unitary pattern. This is evident during the uh, throughout the Hundred Years War. Like by, by the end of it, the Normans essentially loathed the English presence. Right? So the just think how much had changed from the times which was Normandy had conquered England um, in, in perspective. Um, and this negotiational aspect is, uh, is, is expresses fundamentally a success of, of the St. Capetians, even in the moment of crisis. Institutionally, politically, it's just at, the, at, the, uh, at a higher step, right? At the end of the Middle Ages, France will arrive with the best Satwell profile, right? It, it may have been, again, rough and somehow big and kind of, you know, as big the thing is, it's more difficult to control, but still successfully channeling the, the country's resources toward that direction, right? Um, there were countries that, if united, could have even prevented uh, French expansionism. But they didn't have the same degree of unitary power and mindset that France had acquired uh, and kind of imposed, indeed, on the country as well. A country that, however, had not essentially found anything better but just accepting it. So, evidently, having something um, in, uh, in it, too, that we will not discuss today, but especially at the end of the Middle Ages, somehow evident as far as the various hierarchies and the, the bon ville and all these things. The power limits. Uh, another huge uh, factor here are the aforementioned royals themselves. right? Uh, if you look at the venomential history a bit of Europe at this time, you, you find these, this Capet, this Valois, roaming around Europe. Right, as commanders uh, in, I don't know, somewhere in, in Italy or becoming lords of that city, etc. What, what are they doing? They, they're just, these are uh, the king's brothers, and they are roaming around, and they're trying to seize, I don't know, Milan by force. They are um, doing pretty interesting. They become princes of, you know, of some ancient in Fifth Dome. You find them in, 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 uh, in, in the Byzantine, in some expeditions against the Byzantines. So they are, they're not knight errants because they are supported by a magnificent military and logistical system all over France, the, the Mediterranean, and so on. 
they are lords of specific places, right? So they have just their own base. Um, very often they have financial issues and so on. It, this is kind of obvious. But they play at, at big levels, and thus they can influence the monarchic policy. Um, royal princes like Charles and Philip of Valois, they are um, essentially the future Charles IV and Philip V, received, as we've seen with this, that list of lands before, uh, uh, some appanages. Uh, they were apanagist in French, right? So um, these um, the, they would be the same royal blood. There were the great lords also as Aude the, the Fort, Duke of Burgundy, ruling between 1315 and 47. So Burgundy has a sort of parallel, as a copy of of the Parisian government, right? Actually, it was sometimes even the other way around. Burgundy was so updated and kind of centralized in power that it was the Capetians that uh, would copy Burgundy that had all a constitution that prevented it, at least at a certain point, up to a certain point, to be um, um, properly annexated as a royal demand, even though there were some Valois that ruled there. In fact, that's how the Burgundy during the Hundred Years' War um, you know, acted, also in virtue of their own blood. Uh, there were figures like Robert of Artois, died in 1342. Laterally, also the aforementioned Charles II of Navarre, that had some interesting things going on as far as the succession, not just in Navarre, but also with Burgundy and so on, ruling between 1349 and 87. Um, we will discuss them, politically and socially, in another video, because they, they did pretty interesting things on their own, and they... Uh, we could go with some bibliography at some a biography at some point because um, I tried a bit with English kings recently, if you noticed, and we, I think we could start doing it for some other figure here. Um, these people, as I said before, mostly had the typically French mindset of considering uh, whichever public power that they 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 own. Uh, institutional power is a sort of familiar and patrimonial possession, right? Again, they were all married into each other and with international royalty, nobility, anyway. Um, so they lived in that typically, again, we are reading this in a sort of, we know that the state would evolve, but at, at that time they were still pretty hybrid-minded. They understood perfectly what the monarchy how the monarchy worked like, also because, as we've seen, even the ones who opposed the royal centralization sometimes had states that were within themselves way more centralized than the same country. So it, they were all pushing towards the same direction because it's the only civilizational one that exists. And, and these were some of the most advanced, uh, in fact, polities in Europe as far as that kind of development, political, institutional was concerned. Um, there were princes and noblemen playing naturally a leading role in the royal council. They formulated, proposed, but also executed policy, especially the military one. It's like it was an expedition to do, okay, I'll do it, right? Because I know that I can be, I can profit from this in a way or another. It's a way to increase power, prestige. I, uh, I especially if. If I, I mean, if I'm the king, and trusting these tasks to a to a to a relative was seen as, let's hope that he stays more royal, right? It was just a matter of name. These people were deeply imbued with a sense of honor, of um, exaltation of their of their command. They were highly competent politicians and military men, right? Through men at arms, uh, they served abroad, as we've seen, they had a, a wide range of international experience in all these affairs. They had their own courts. I mean, that's how they leaked. Uh, um, itinerating, right? It was spent some years in a place, some months in another, sometimes even across different countries. Uh, and they uh, essentially were always searching for money and for kind of high connections, and they simply knew that at some point, I don't know, if your brother died accidentally, it could happen, I mean, suddenly at, at that time, or there was some, some you, you were 
maybe just to become king yourself, but in the meanwhile you had just to win your own place in the world. We have seen it even in the aforementioned video of, of Louis XI, who quarreled with, with his father, even though he was the Dauphin, uh, so heir apparent um, to the same throne, and he would even risk his life in sieges, other battles, and so on. Why? Because power was to be sold, even just for f um, future rule. It was enormously complicated to govern, as we have just been appreciating. Um, naturally, these men had a great weight also as far as the aforementioned counselors could, uh, ministers could, um, could be appointed or, you know, taken out, right? Um, Marigny, that we mentioned before in 1315, suffered this fate. Uh, Berot de Morcoeur, that was constable of France too in 1319. Uh, they they had a special preferential place, permanent one actually, in the Parisian counts. So the most important where the court, the royal court was, uh, uh, and uh, they uh, they also were just to entrust a part of royal power sometimes. Uh, I mean to to confer a, a part of their own power to the king to rule their own personal lordships while they were away. Right? It was yet another way the king could increase his power, right? Um, let's assume your your brother is, I don't know, the Count of Anjou. Well, you know, if he can't stay in Anjou all the time, he's staying in Naples, because normally, yeah, that's what the thing they were. The king of Naples were also Counts of Anjou. Well, that Anjou was to be uh, administered in, in some way that at that point you could somehow share even within this royal s circle, right, of blood. Uh, we can see uh, an important closeness of uh, Etienne de Mornay and Charles of Valois, who also employed Jean de Cherchemont and Jean Billoir, that uh, were essentially gravitating as ministers around the crown. Some, some of them were already made men there by the kings, or would be made, also thanks to this previous connection. They had to trust each other. That was the issue. I mean, being so close, and that, so that you could easily compromise. By compromising each other, you would compromise the entire system that was nurturing you. So it wouldn't make sense, any sense. Um... There was the aforementioned Guillaume de Bruyne, author of the Stylus Curiae Parlamenti in 1332, who was um, patronized by even Edward III of England, the Count of Cominges, and Robert of Artois. Uh, or better, he was, yeah, he was patronized, much as he sometimes patronized the same individual, because he was so powerful. Right, that he could, for example, partially pay the debts, um, um, uh, let's say, of uh, Cominge to ensure his own ennoblement. Because th th these were, of course, individuals aiming at the nobility that was really the one that ruled the country. And so, as civil servant, you know, the noblesse de, de robe as opposed to the noblesse de pay. Uh, so, they had. Uh, Vast, vast um, ambitions, power, connections, and uh, they would have, even in this case, a king of England kind of moving around him for reasons that, as I understand, also go beyond by, by scale. So it's a complicated set of uh, connections between the center, the periphery, uh, Say that the, also the the rules that are just established to 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 affirm a convention of government of a certain creed, right? Um, there are groups, there are different factions aside from the parties of the Chambre de Comte and the Parlement. For example, there are in these years the Bur the so-called Burgundians, the the Champenois, the Normans, 
as different groups also with diver very different background in many ways that however push this or for this or this other policy and that uh, were all connected with the king, the territory, uh, I mean the communities uh, and more. Right, these were middlemen, intermediaries, fixers, um, anyone who could essentially uh, get the thing done, right, so also in shady ways sometimes, there is the Navarrese party in the 50s, for example, that bro that enters this, this game and triggers a very bitter infighting. Um, so it's there, there is a violent competition as well, but it's still being defined within kind of a red tape uh, level that ensures these people to also kind of a um, uh, coalize by status, right? It's the late medieval nobility that takes shape in that kind of upper subtle level, as opposed to the military class that had formed in the 10th century, so an increasingly vertical and stratified world. Uh, there are sometimes even modest figures, it's rare, rarer at least. Um, Heli de Papasol, for example, was a notary of Perigueux, who uh, uh, was naturally expanding for a reward he was sent on a legitimate mission for his town council in Perugue in 1337. Um, his Le Ferry de Pequigny, the Pequigny, who was master of the royal household, five um, pounds of lemons and five of sugar, so that he could approach the same king. It's interesting, you think, what's the appropriate gift to bribe um, a royal official, right, to, in, in the 14th century, to, well, yes, a uh, bag of lemons and sugar. In, in 1330, uh, some Lombards offered uh, the Countess of Alençon, for example, a box of oranges uh, to kind of uh, speed up some bureaucratic process there. Um, so, normal means, of course, at the time that do show the, the patronage, the, 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 the interests involved, etc., but also affect the power that these communities own on their own. Like, what's your capacity to? To make leverage on this uh, on this system, right? You can show that you're adequately powerful, that you're respectful, that you are ready to go by the the rules of the system, and so this had always been the case, of course. But it starts consolidating better for us to to, to see clearly a direction there that is not just. Um, an exasperated kind of ideological claim to, to retain all the system together, like it could be at a time flip the fort, but essentially even in times of brutal crisis, like the one of the mid-14th century, the defeat um, on the battlefield, the, 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 the betrayals of entire provinces, um, you uh, can fundamentally um, uh, you know, create a a system that self perpetrates, uh, say that, that established um, itself stable, right? That that is meant to continue over time. That is going to become the the, the formal official way things have to work, and it starts happening in an ever more solid way from from this time onwards. Actually, we will talk again about French politics, government during this time. We we talked about so many kings today uh, that all are worth to to, to uh, multiple videos on their own. Um, we will, however, see this better. Um, on another point, for today, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.